Right on time, Sister Shirley. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I was thinking George had probably done the first novel. Oh, my goodness. I'll get it. <laughs> everyone on Facebook to our service, the Shorewood Bible Church South Church. And uh, please feel free to sing along. And no, it says uh, 431. Christ is all that he claims to be, and I'm so glad that he lives in me. My hope of glory, yes, he is, for he is mine, and I am his. What a friend we have in Jesus, number 431. Thou 
Good morning again. Morning. I'm going to be a scripture reader this morning. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And verses 1 through 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, we'll read responsibly and together on verse 12. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And thy father, provoke not your children to die. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of heart, as unto Christ. With good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men. And you masters do the same on same things unto them, for bear threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let us all hearts in the morning prayer. My gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, throne of grace, with hearts of thanksgiving, thanking you for who you are, the God of heaven and earth, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The God who commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And we thank you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who was not high-minded, but condescended to men of low estate. He who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that performs a work of sealing us until the redemption of the purchased possession, making our salvation sure. Uh, taking your word and making it a li living reality in our hearts and minds. We thank you for your word around which we gather to stay, which is able to make one wise unto salvation. Your word, which is not like any other word, Heavenly Father, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And we thank you. This is our prayer, Heavenly Father, as we gather together around your word to study your word, that we'll receive it. Not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, that effectually worketh in them that believe. We thank you for the fellowship, the coming together of like-minded saints, Heavenly Father, uh, for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort, and to be an encouragement to one another, uh, to strengthen one another, Heavenly Father as we look to the remainder of our service, we pray for listening ears and believing hearts. And we pray when all is said and done will be to the glory and to the honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, the 
our next song is Stand Up for Jesus, number 476. And we'll do one and four. 476, number one and four. Thank God. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till Sunday, 
October 31st at 1 p.m., number four, including the mutual face. We continue to uh, be mindful of our sick and shut in. Uh, Sister Sarah Ruffin, Sam Gosey, and uh, Mary Woods, Brother Sam and Sister Mary Woods. Are there any other announcements outside of the building I'm not aware of? Father, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to gather together for the purpose of uh, not only the study of thy word, but the praise uh, of you, toward you, for thy word, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for one another in Christ. We pray, Lord, that all that we might collect here today will go to the furtherance of the ministry, according to thy good will and purpose. We thank you for our crafts and this family, that they continue to be strengthened and encouraged in spite of what's going on out here around us. Uh, near and far, Heavenly Father. And we're mindful of all them that are sick and, and afflicted and shut in, Father. We pray only that they might remember, Heavenly Father, uh, that, that your strength, according to thy word, resident in them, might be enough to sustain them, Heavenly Father, through these times of trial and tribulation in our physical body as well as in the community. We thank you for this, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sweet to trust in Jesus, amen. Number 368. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus our Lord. And we'll do uh, one and four. You gotta stand for this one. Tis so sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the said the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. How I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus.
All right, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. This is Gospel Sunday, and uh, we will focus our attention on the Gospel matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. That was a little pamphlet or booklet Pastor Cornelius or Pastor Cornelius R. Stan wrote entitled Simple as Can Be simple as can be. And there was a booklet about the subject of salvation. The subject of the gospel. Of su a subject of the various gospel messages. Anyone considering the question, what must I do to be saved? are confronted with. And when you think about the title, Simple As Can Be, when Christendom gets involved, then it's an entirely different concept. It, it becomes very complex yeah. and confusing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul makes a statement that we're going to talk about here this morning. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you Say Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Um, as I think about that, I think about the scripture. I believe it's Second Corinthians chapter eleven in verse three. When Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified, that simplifies everything. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 3, Paul makes another statement here. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And that's what happens when Christendom gets involved in answering the question, what must I do to be saved? It is rather great simplicity a very simple approach. If you take into account some matters in Scripture. Now, I want to bring some clarity. I might sound like another voice. And, and in fact, the world you and I live in, we don't live in a vacuum. Uh, we don't live in a world where there is only one voice speaking. Uh, we live in a world where there are many voices speaking. And that fact alone is what complicates the answer. What must I do to be saved?
But again, that is simplified greatly when you believe the Word of God, especially when you take the method of Bible study set forth in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When we rightly divide the word of God, then it is a simple, a simple matter. And it is a subject when you rightly divide that there can be great clarity. And again, my desire is to bring great clarity to a subject where great confusion exists, where if you get it wrong, has eternal consequences. Look at John chapter 8 in verse 24. John chapter 8 in verse 24. In John, in the Gospel of John, and when you're reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a key that must be taken into account so as not to become part of the confusion, not to become prey to the confusion, you want to keep a verse like Romans 15, 8 in mind when you're reading the gospel. Mm -hmm. Paul looks back at the gospels and he says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That is an idea, that is a concept that you must take into account. Now, I say that especially in the light of John chapter 8 and verse 24, when Jesus said, I said therefore unto you. You remember Matthew 15, 24? Jesus said, I am not sent, but unto who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when you read a verse like this, I said therefore unto you, you who? Who is Christ speaking to? Israel. And what does he say to Israel? I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sin. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now my first and most important point here is that if you get this question about what you must do to be saved wrong, it has eternal consequences. It had eternal consequences for who? according to this verse. And eternal consequences for Israel. He said, unless ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sin. Look at Matthew 16. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, The issue is not Christ and him crucified. Again, I say the issue in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not Christ and him crucified. In Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13, 
When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now what did Jesus say in John 8? Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So what's the question in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who is Jesus? Who is the man? Christ Jesus. Verse 14, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Unless ye believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sin. The question for Israel, the question for Israel, was who is Christ? Who is Jesus, brethren? In verse 16, in Simon, I rather, we read verse 16. Uh, verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar John, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto me, but my Father which is in heaven. But unless ye believe that I am he, eternal consequences, if you get the question, what must I do to be saved? The answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? If you get that wrong, but if you're reading a verse like John 8, 24, the question for Israel was, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? There was something Israel was to believe that if not, had eternal consequences for them. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And the Apostle Paul writes here, well, let's start back at... Uh, Verse 3. Verses 3 through 9. Well, we would we'll include verse 10, make it complete. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceeding, and the, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounding. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his presence, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. There was something for the people that the Apostle Paul ministered to. 
that if they did not believe his gospel, his message, has some eternal consequences associated with it. And you notice, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Um, look back at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And we'll start at verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentile. In the gospel, we have a message of salvation being presented to the nation of Israel. It was a message of salvation that centered in the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Israel rejected that message of salvation to them. The results of Israel's rejection, remember what Jesus said, you shall what? Die in your sin, which again would have spelled eternal consequences for their rejection. In fact, in prophecy, the wrath of God was to be God's response to Israel's rejection yes. of the Lord Jesus Christ. But rather than responding in wrath and in judgment, God ushered in a dispensation of grace and a message of grace, an unprophesied dispensation of grace and an unprophesied message of grace. And he ushered that dispensation and that message with the salvation of the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus. Hence Paul writing in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He says, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So rather than urging in a, a day of wrath and judgment, God saved the chief of sinners and sent a message of salvation to the Gentile. Romans 11, 11 and 12 says, I say then, have they stumbled, they who, Israel, have Israel stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. So we read again in verse 46, but seeing ye put it from you, Israel, that is, put it from you, that is everlasting life, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentile. Now watch verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 3. So God raises up a new apostle 
with a new gospel. A gospel message to all the world. In Romans 11, 30-32, God had concluded them all in unbelief. God concluded Israel in unbelief along with the Gentile that he might have mercy upon all. So in Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes to some of the converts among the Gentiles he had gone preaching to. I want you to observe what the issue was. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? These are people who Paul had converted, gotten saved, and now they're going back on the gospel that was delivered there. But notice what Paul said. That you should not obey the truth. And why? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been what? Evidently set forth what? Crucified among them. So what is the issue in Paul's gospel? Christ and him crucified. Not whom do men say that I, the son of man, am. But here it is an issue of Christ and him crucified. Um, verse 2, this only would I learn of you. Receive ye the spirit, of, the spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I don't need the rest of that. I just wanted to make a point that uh, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So when Paul says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Paul is talking about a distinct community of believers, unique to the dispensation of grace, who are suffering for their faith in Christ and Him crucified. And for those who rejected Paul's gospel, and by the way, what's, what's my point here? We see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John one gospel. Begin with Paul, we see another gospel. They're not the same. But both are scriptural. Both messages are messages from God. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people got saved simply by acknowledging, that is, people of Israel, God saved by simply acknowledging Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they became part of, of a program that would result in eternal life. If you believe that that's how God saves you today, it will not make you part of a program that would result in eternal life. It will make you religious, You will find scriptural information about what you believe, but it won't save you. And you have to make that transition, that shift from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God. And again, my point here, people aren't dying and going to hell because they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, of, the Son of God. People are going to hell because they don't believe in Christ and Him crucified. And maybe let me say it another way. You can believe that Christ is the Son of God. 
but not believe that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And you'll still go to hell. Because the issue today is Christ and him crucified. And the message of Christ and him crucified is different from whom do men say that I, the son of man, am. It's dealing with an entirely different issue, an entirely different matter. It's not dealing with kingdom. In Romans 5, in verse 12, Paul wrote, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The issues have changed. And the consequences of not acknowledging the gospel of the grace of God can result in an eternal damnation in hell, regardless of how scriptural you might be in every other respect. Because the issue today is Christ and Him crucified. And if you do not believe that, or you confuse, and let me, let me, by the way, let me just add this. If you mix the two messages, you corrupt it. Right. And you believe in something God never gave you to believe. And you can, come, you can have the seemingly security and comfort and believe in a mixed message because it's like trying to have it both ways. Is trying to have it every which way. And think you got all your bases cut and therefore you think, no, that's not faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, let me just move on because time is getting away. So, what about, what do we... For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him what? Crucified. So what I want to talk to you about basically is the way of salvation. The path, the plan of salvation. And it is set forth in God's word through the Apostle Paul. And I have to add that. I have to qualify that with such a statement because it matters. All the Bible is for you, but it's not all to you. All the Bible is for you, but it's not all about you. And if salvation truly is going to be simple, you must rightly divide the word of truth. So salvation, what I want you to learn about salvation, that it is the gift of God. and can only be received by faith in Christ and Him crucified. Now, again, if you're still there in 1 Timothy 1, or you're in Thessalonians, 1 Timothy 1, go over one book. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want you to note the last statement in verse 7, and verse 16. And Paul talks about being a pattern of the long-suffering of Christ to them we should hereafter, after him. Paul marks that dividing line between what God was doing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace, Romans to Philemon. To them we should hereafter, what? Believe on him to life everlasting. Now, life everlasting, Christ is the key to everlasting life, whether you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or whether you're in Romans to Philemon. The Lord Jesus Christ is the key to life, to, ever, to, to everlasting life. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's the key to everlasting life according to prophecy. 
in Romans to Philemon, he's the key to everlasting life when you view him uh, according to the revelation of the mystery. And that's Romans 16, 25, and 26. And again, people fail to rightly divide the word of truth tend to merge those two gospel messages together and produce a gospel God never gave to preach. It sounds good. It sounds scriptural. I mean, you know, you got you got verses that talks about the identity of Christ, and then you got verses that talks about the crucifixion of Christ. But without distinction. And you just put it all together, and it seems like it, you know, it all fits. It just seems naturally normal. It's not. And your eternal life hangs in the balance of in distinguishing between those two gospel messages. That's why it's rightly dividing what? The word of truth. What you've got in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what? Truth. What you have in Romans to Philemon is what? Truth. But they're different truth to different people at different times with different requirements, uh, as it were. Parallel issues, but most certainly different messages. Um, salvation is the gift of God, again, and can only be received by faith in Christ and Him crucified today. You cannot get saved. No man is saved apart from believing in Christ and Him crucified today in the dispensation of grace. Now that being said, people are confronted when they read Scripture. And this is why, again, 2 Timothy 2.15 is such a critical verse to keep in view when you're reading and studying this this matter. But look at Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now we're talking about, again, the way of salvation, the path to being saved, or the plan of salvation. Okay. And so you got a guy here during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that raises the question, what must I do? Uh to have eternal life. Now, I think it's noteworthy that he is conscious or aware of the fact that there is such a thing as eternal life. And that, you know, it began with an awareness. It began with a knowledge that there is life after death. Um, get John chapter 5. Keep your place there, Matthew. I'm coming back there. But John chapter 5. And see, again, no one is going to concern themselves with the question or with the issue of eternal life. Unless, unless they become aware or knowledgeable of the fact that there is life after death. In John chapter 5, beginning at verse 
beginning at verse 20, uh, let's start at verse um, 26. Well, let's start at verse 25. Verily, verily, Jesus is speaking. I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Until an individual becomes knowledgeable of the fact that there is life after death. They're not going to have any interest. They're not going to ask the question. Now, as it was with Christ and his apostles, they made it an issue by preaching, telling people. And that's what you and I have to do. Eternal life is not an automatic, the, the question or, or the issue of eternal. And again, the world that you and I live in is full of human, human wisdom, human viewpoint. Do you think people are confused about all the, the different religious voices out there? Throw so in the non-religious world, philosophies and ideas. And you really complicate matters. And you don't know what to believe. But in such a world, God provides his own testimony for the world to, to consider. God provides his own testimony to weigh, to raise people awareness of what they're actually faced with in life. I mean, people are trying to figure life out, and they got all these ideas about what life is all about. Well, again, God has raised up his own testimony and witness to make them aware and to provide them reason why. And, and, and with that in mind, look at Acts chapter 17 real quick. I gotta wrap, wrap this up here. We have communion this morning. But look at Acts chapter 17. Now, you have God's word you have many typical truths in God's Word to teach principally the nation of Israel and by, by Israel, by proxy through Israel, to teach the world about, ever, about eternal life. And so the rich young ruler was is, is no is no surprise, especially being a Jew, especially being of the nation of Israel, that he would ask such a question. But my basic point is you have to be knowledgeable and aware of eternal life 
to ask the question, what must I do to have eternal life? Go back to uh, Matthew uh, 19. Verse 17. Oh, I told you Acts, didn't I? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was conscious of the fact that my time is up. Uh, Acts 17, in verse 31. Well, let's start at verse 30. And the times of this ignorance got winked at. And that's when men were just given up to their own wisdom, to, to idolatry. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he had the point of the day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath what? Raised him from. If there's any question or any doubt about life after death. The resurrection of Christ puts a, puts a, a big exclamation point at the end of, to the to the answer to that question. Absolutely. So in Matthew 19, let me just kind of finish this thought. Verse 17. Matthew. 19, verse 17. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Either I'm God, there's nothing good about me. Okay? And that's the only two choices you have when it comes to Christ. Either he's God, or there's nothing good about him. But if thou wilt enter into life, what was Christ's answer? Keep the commandments. Now Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you save what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm going to kind of really abbreviate the rest of my message by referring to Romans 10.4. Now, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that what? Believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek or to the Gentile. Salvation is the gift of God. But God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ die for us and can only be received by faith because everything that needed to be done was done by the Lord Jesus Christ and the only thing you can do without doing anything is simply to put your faith and your trust and your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved all right um, if you have not trusted Christ person as your Savior then don't let the moment pass because what is your life? It's even a baby. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Now is the accepted time. If you understand what God requires for you to be saved, then do that. If you don't understand, then seek somebody out to help them give you greater clarity. And then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All right, um, we're going to...
prepared for a communion service. And so we're going to be exiting Facebook at this time.